Okay, well, by my clock on the computer, it's showing 7.30 exactly. So we'll go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order. And uh, Holly, if you would like to call the roll, please. Yes, Director Ferris. Hello, Director Ferris. Oh, he's not here. Director Falls? Here. Director Henry? Here. Director Moran? Present. Director Swan? Here. Okay. Uh, did we know if Lou is having any issues or is he? Well, I guess he'll get here when he gets here. Okay, let's, uh, let me ask, are there any additions or deletions to the closed session agenda, Rick? I have none and I don't believe, does council have any? None from me, thank you. Okay, thank you. So now we'll open the uh, meeting for any comments uh, regarding the closed session. Uh, so do we have any, do we have any oral communications, any comments from the public? Doesn't look like we have any public. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fine. Okay. Can you uh, take this thing off the screen and get back to the regular? Thank you. Uh, okay. So in that case, we will adjourn to the uh, closed session. So if the directors will please join the uh, link for the closed session, we'll huddle up in just a few minutes. And please, we have everyone, to be sure to um, leave the Zoom meeting. Don't just leave it, you know, running on a on a screen in the background. And uh, did you send us a link to the the new site? Yes, it, it came. I sent it again just a few minutes ago. It came, it's a, uh, let's see, comes from the calendar. I can do that again. Okay, thank you. So I have to leave this meeting, join another one. And you have the link. It'll take me a while. The session, the session is the convened again now at 6 uh, 30 some odd. 6 34, I have. Yeah, nobody does that at the uh, screen. Uh, okay, so we're back in the open session. Uh, okay. okay, there is nothing to report um, out of closed session. And uh, so let me ask, uh, Rick, are there any additions or deletions to the open session agenda? I have none. Okay, thank you. Okay, so at this time we have uh, oral communication. So any uh, anybody in the public who's joined the meeting that has anything they would like to comment on that is not addressed in the open session agenda may do so at this time. So let's see. Participants. There we go. We have eight attendees. It looks like. Does anyone have anything they wish to comment on? Not at this time. So it seems. So Returning back to the agenda, Rick, it's uh, item nine, unfinished business. So I'll leave it to you. Okay, thank you, Chair uh, Swan. Item I, 9A is the CZU wildfire damage assessment report. You should have received uh, the, the damage assessment report. Um, this was um, completed by Sandius, uh, the engineering firm that's assisting the district uh, in uh, Repairs uh, as a result of uh, the fire. Uh, progress is moving. We're moving right along um, with uh, the water treatment plant, lion tank areas, and the form and diversion and pipeline. Uh, as you can see in the report that on they're on site, uh, we had a uh, cleanup crew 
on site uh, to pump out and clean the lion tank. Um, uh, we accessed inside the tank and had to put scaffolding in to, to pressure wash uh, and to uh, collect samples inside the tank. I, uh, I can refer to James if we received samples back uh, from after the cleaning of that. I'm not sure if we've actually got results of the samples yet. No samples have been received back yet on the swab yeah. test on the tanks. Uh, that tank, you know, which line tank is our largest uh, tank up at the treatment facility. Uh, the cleanup went well, you know, from the, from a visual, it appeared that uh, we were successful cleaning, but until we actually uh, get results back uh, on VOCs, we do not know. Uh, the little lion uh, is unsuccessful to clean. Uh, the uh, debris from the, the burning HDPE pipe is, is embedded into the coatings, into the rafters. So that'll take a sandblasting and, and recoating. Uh, Sandias, we're putting together uh, as we speak, uh, formal specifications in a bid package to go out for a quick formal bidding to turn that around. Um, now, if, if we can put Lion back, that takes a lot of pressure off on getting Little Lion back on. So we can take a little time uh, with the formal bidding and, and make sure we reach out and, and, and get some, uh, some good pricing. Uh, Lewis and Tibbetts uh, is the construction crew that's up on site that's replacing the 10 and 12 inch main lines uh, that we had 10 and 12 inch above ground uh, HTPE pipe connecting those three reservoirs together that melted in the fire that uh, caused a lot of this uh, paintings or this coatings damage. They're in the process. Uh, now, once the trees were removed, the hazardous and dangerous trees that were removed, we're in the process of, of installing in the ground uh, 10 and 12 inch ductile iron main. Uh, so that's uh, quite a change that from what was up there. Not only we changed pipe material, but we are uh, bearing it to AWWA standards. Uh, so things are going good. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done up there. There's still additional uh, hazardous trees uh, and chipping and some large down trees that were that were fell by uh, the contractor that need to be removed. But we're working on, on pricing on that as we move forward. Uh, the foreman diversion line has been, uh, for now we'll call it temporary replaced with HDPE. It's imperative that we try to get the Lion water treatment plant back online. We need to get water running through that plant before we start having, you know, chemical feed lines uh, clog and, and, and do a, a lot of damage to the, the treatment facility just by sitting. Treatment facilities do not like to sit. They like to have water moving through the filter media and all the chemical feed. So the contractor has installed the pipe bench, has went back in right behind the pipe bench uh, and trenched. Uh, you'll see some of the pictures uh, in the SanDisk report. Uh, the, all of the pipe has been put in the ground and has been backfilled. Uh, it's tied in at the treatment plant and it's very closely to being tied in uh, at, the, uh, at the intake. Um, so we're moving on that, um, getting close to being able to bring water to the treatment plant. However, there will be some issues with debris flows and turbidity. Uh, with rainfall, so we're not yet sure of when we'll be bringing the, the first water um, into the tank. Did I leave anything out, James, for that we're, that we're working on uh, um, construction? Uh, well, I'll just go back to your pipeline that Lewis and Tibbetts is working on between Big okay. Lion and Little Lion and Big Steel and Big Steel Booster. That has all been, it is installed and it is to the connection points as right. of now they're getting ready to chlorinate and disinfect those lines and get those ready to get put back into service obviously we will not be able to put little lion back in the service but we can put big line back in the service as soon as we get testing back and then we will go through the state and make sure everything's all approved correct and what well, we also have the over the overflow line uh, has to be replaced on lion because we were not successful on uh, cleaning that overflow pipe. So that is some tank piping that has to be replaced it on, am I correct? Right. On that. So uh, with that, uh, that kind of concludes where we're at on repairs at this time. We're also in the process of reaching out to 
our environmental consultants and engineering consultants and starting to talk about a report on the raw water pipelines to do an analysis of what would be best the way to replace that pipe, whether it's, uh, uh, and the type of construction. Uh, we're getting uh, information back from uh, on our environmental people and on engineering people on that. So that, and that will be coming to the board. There'll be a, a, a great deal of discussion regarding replacement of those above ground uh, and HDPE lines that, uh, uh, that we lost during the fire. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the board for questions. Okay, do you have any uh, questions or comments from the board? Rick, Rob, go ahead. Yeah, thanks Rick for that uh, update. With respect to the um, pipe that's going in underground to AWWA standards, does that mean that if God forbid another fire were to go through there that those pipes wouldn't be cooked um, and create VOCs that they're far enough in the ground that um, that, that would not happen. You know, that is correct. They're I think they have close to three foot of cover on top of them. Uh, I would say yes, so that it should not be. It should yeah. not or will not? Will not, will not. I, I never say never, Bob, you know, I, I I can never say never that, you know, trees may not come down and, you know, damage the pipe on hillsides or whatever, but fire should not impact that pipe. And is that, is that deeper then than what the pipes in paradise were? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I am not sure of the depth uh, on it. And, and paradise pipes, the ones that had the steam intrusion were HDPE as well. Um, right. That was the issue. It wasn't. It wasn't the fact that the pipes heated up too much. It was the steam that went into the plastic pipes, and the VOCs stick to the plastic pipe, and that's how right. they got contaminated. It wasn't from heat up of the main lines in the road. I, I, as long as the AWWA has updated, if they have any of their specs based on fire experience, that's, that's yeah. Fine. I I haven't looked at that specifically, but I know we that pipe has been installed. Um, with restraints and in depth and material to AWWA specs. Um, and, you know, we, we went, you know, that was our ma a major facility. We lost over 50%, a little over 50% of our storage. Mm -hmm. And that's unacceptable. We can't put back pipe that's going to be impacted by fire. It had to be hardened. We went right in. We didn't put temporary pipe in above ground. We went right back in and installed you know, ductile, buried. Um, yes, it's a little more uh, expense, but it had to be done. It, it's just too valuable of a location for us not to to harden. No, I, I, I agree. I think that yeah. that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that their standards basically were that if it's that deep, no fire is going to affect it. Thank you. Right. Should and, the intake, and the intake line is what was put in an HDPE which is the raw water line, all the other lines are being put in a ductile steel and still being buried three feet deep. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Director Moran, you have a question or comment? E yes. Um, so the hazardous material that's being removed, whether it's from inside the tanks or from various other pieces of material that we own or have, what is being done with that and is it being transported off-site? How is the hazardous material being uh, taken care of? Great question, James. Yeah, so that is all being pressure washed and that is being pumped out of the tanks. And that is being filtered through carbon filters. And the discharge of that water is tested and it, all, it is all um, clean water that's being discharged out into the drain system. Now, on the piping and everything, we have taken that and piled it all up because we have to keep it for FEMA inspection. And so none of that has been removed from site. That will be removed from, from site after we get FEMA inspection and the okay and the clear that the projects are good. And those will be hauled to a hazmat facility at that point. Foreman, okay. foreman radio room, James, your procedures there are the foreman room. The Foreman Radio Room, we are going with a company named ECGR, 
and they're an asthmat company. I do believe that's the name of them. It's some, it's some kind of acronym. Um, but they are coming in. It's costing us $15,000. It was a battery room and a testing room. And so in order to hazmat and mitigate that, they have to clean the pad, dismantle the pad, and then test underneath the pad for hazmat after the cleanup's done. And all of that will be hauled out to a button willow facility, which is hazmat facility, or into, into Nevada at a hazmat facility. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lois. Uh, you have a comment or question? I, I do. Um, I can prove my ignorance. Um, ductile iron pipes, how are they connected to each other? And does that withstand uh, really hot ground or, uh, I mean, is it is it just iron fittings or is it soldered or what is it? That's actually a very good question. There's, there's issues with that, especially being above ground. James, you wanna talk about the gaskets? Yeah, so being buried, they, it's been proven that the gaskets do not melt in a buried situation. It has to get to 600 degrees for the gaskets to melt and they're all push joints with the gasket on every joint. It's about an 18 foot joint every time. And above ground, it would be a problem because a forest fire can get up to six to 700 degrees is what we're told by the engineering group that's doing this. And so the gasket is a problem above ground, but underground they don't, they don't believe and it's, AWWA standards put that in the ground. Nobody knows how much the ground can actually heat up in a really, really bad fire. So I can't say that it wouldn't be damaged, but AWWA, AWWA standards says it won't. Okay. All right. Just, Good just question. needed to ask. I, I don't hardly know what I'm talking about. <laughs> just a concern. Thank you, Lois. Do we have any other uh, questions? for any of the directors. If not, we'll go to the public. Do we have any questions or comments from any of the uh, participants on this call? Uh, Tina, you're recognized, please. Share your comment or question. Hi there, I have uh, two questions. Go right ahead. Uh, first one is um, the iron pipes, will they face any rust issues? No, they're lined on the inside. Oh, okay. And on the outside, they're bagged with a, a plastic uh, protection wrap. Okay. And then the other thing was, um, uh, what are the, what, what do you foresee as issues with like an earthquake with these harder pipes versus like, before the, the pipes were more flexible. And so now, um, yeah. So what are the, the issues you foresee if we have earthquakes? Well, I, the, the, only way I, the only thing I can tell you on the answer to that, I, I was here in the 89 earthquake and our large ductile iron pipe flexed. They're only, they're 18 foot joints and they do have some movement to them. And it is a very heavy, strong pipe. We had, uh, I don't believe any leaks on the ductile iron pipe joints uh, in the 89 earthquake. Uh, and the galvanized pipe, we had a lot of leaks, but the, the ductile pipe came through the earthquake with hardly any issues whatsoever. I mean, du ductile iron pipe is probably the best product on the market. Um, and it's probably the most expensive for your basic water system. And each Thank joint you. has five degrees of deflection in each direction before it will snap or break a joint. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tina. Any other uh, questions or comments from the public? Okay, I don't see any. Rick, we'll move on to, oh, sorry, Holly, you have a question. <laughs> no, not exactly. I saw that no one else did. So I just wanted to say we did not take roll when we reconvened the meeting. So if it's all right with you, I'd like to do that now. Sure. Uh, we finished. There's no more comments from the attendees, so uh, go right ahead, Holly. Roll the take the roll. Director Ferris here. Director Falls here. Director Henry here. Director Moran.
Unmuted, present. And, and President Swan. Okay, thank you, and Holly. I just wanted to note that um, all of the people were present when we did reconvene at 634. Is that what you were going to say, Gina? That was, yes, back uh, when we convened to open the session. Okay, thanks for keeping us honest. Rick, back to unfinished okay, business. Uh, moving right along the 9B, it, it's going to be a, an update uh, on the CZU wildfire water quality update. Uh, um, we've been talking about this for some time since the fire, um, and due to the, uh, the lightning complex fire that started back on uh, uh, 8 16, 2020, uh, the high density polyethylene lines that we've been talking about. Uh, that were in direct line of the fire were damaged, uh, melted, uh, that, that caused depressurization uh, of our water distribution system. And immediately after that discovery uh, by the district, uh, we contract, uh, contacted our regulatory agency, the State Water Resources Control Board, uh, who recommended uh, issuing a, a precautionary do not drink, uh, do not boil notice to all uh, affected residents uh, in our depressurized area. Anytime you depressurize uh, a water system, you have a, a potential uh, for contamination in general. But given with the fire and the HDE pipe, we issued not only a, a do not drink, but a do not boil order. In preparation, um, um, in preparation of the fire, the district was able to isolate several areas in the distribution system before some of the HDPE mains were destroyed. Volatile organic compounds, VOC, are a possible contaminant uh, of the depressurization zones due to the melting of the HDPE. Um, on September 8, 2020, the district uh, learned that benzene was uh, detected in a water sample taken out on a creek drive out in the Riverside Grove neighborhood. The sample was taken back on uh, September 4, 2020. Um, the part of Riverside Grove neighborhood where the samples were taken is still to this date uh, under a do not drink, uh, do not boil advisory. Uh, the Riverside Grove neighborhood was heavily impacted by the lightning complex fire. Evidence from recent wild uh, fires suggests that benzene contamination is likely to occur when structures are damaged by fire. When structures burn and the uh, water system experiences low pressure, uh, plastic particles, gases, and other fire-related contamination can be drawn into the water connections and may get uh, past the meter into the public water system. The, out in that area, when that fire went through Riverside Grove, we did not lose any facilities or any HDE products. We're pretty confident that all our contamination came back through uh, the damaged homes by fire, back through back siphonage when we depressurized because of, uh, of the fire. Um, currently, uh, the district is removing service laterals connected to structures that were destroyed by fire uh, in the San Lorenzo Valley service area. Um, I do believe to date, and James, you can help me out here, to date we have removed all of the, uh, uh, the uh, service laterals to uh, burn structures in the Riverside Grove area, and we are getting close to completing removing uh, the service laterals in the, the Big Basin Way um, Park Drive, West Park area. Is that correct, James? Uh, on that? That's correct. Right. So, and to date, uh, we have restored uh, most of our customers, except we still have 337 customers remain on the do not drink, do not boil. Notice, uh, these 337 customers are mostly uh, located in the West Park Highway 236 area uh, and up in the Riverside Grove area. Now that we've removed uh, all of these, uh, the service lines in Riverside Grove, we are uh, conducting one more round of distributions wide zone sampling in the Riverside Grove zone. Once we get the results back, and we're assuming from our, our, our lab work that we've been continuing, or sampling be continuing, that we'll have a non detecting contamination. And if that is the case, and, and after the uh, the water state water resource control board reviews that data, we can release the do not drink order in Riverside Grove, and we're hoping that could be by late next week. The uh, 
West Park area, Payone Drive, we're still removing uh, service laterals. We've been working on the weekends. We're getting close to completed and we're uh, anticipating that uh, we should be back in water if the sampling and everything goes okay and the state uh, releases that do not drink by uh, October 28th. Uh, we still have uh, some work to do and this is all contingent on non-detect service, uh, non-detect uh, sampling throughout the distribution system. Uh, water quality crew is taking a large amount of samples and uh, I think to date uh, we have uh, taken approximately 240 mainline samples uh, for VOC and we're still continuing sampling. Our results are showing non-detect in most of the areas. We have had detects in these individual service lines that are not part of the, the actual distribution system to where there's nobody at those homes. They've been shut off right after the fire, but we're sampling them as we pull out to try to determine where some of this contamination is coming from. So, you know, we have a positive outlook coming forward. We're hoping by uh, October 28th uh, that we're 100% back in water. We might have one or two isolated homes that had damage in some isolated neighborhoods that we're still working on, but we're working with a couple individual customers. But the majority of our system, hopefully by the uh, 28th, we'll be back in, in potable water. And with that, uh, Nate, I kind of went through some of this. Do you want to get in the weeds on any of this or uh, uh, you can answer questions or something you'd like to add? Yeah, I've got nothing to add. Uh, summed it up nicely, Rick. Yeah. With that, I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, Rick. With, uh, with regards to the estimate of returning the service back on the 28th, uh, what sort of communication has been going on between the water district and the residents that are currently affected? Nate, you want to take that? Yeah, so uh, we put out a, a, a notification this week just uh, notifying uh, affected customers on the process we're going to be going through before we are able to make a proposal to our regulatory agency to lift the do not drink, do not boil notice. So it was essentially a three-step process uh, step one is background data generation. Step two is physical removal of all uh, service laterals connected to burn structures, which is in progress right now in uh, the um, West Park neighborhood. Um, it has been completed in the Riverside Grove neighborhood. Um, after step two is complete, we will be moving in to do one more large sampling of all areas of the affected zone. And uh, once data comes back, assuming data looks favorable, uh, we'll be presenting our case to the State Water Resources Control Board for do not drink, do not boil, uh, notice lifting. Um, so we've communicated that process with our customers, but as Rick mentioned, this is all contingent upon um, favorable lab results. Um, so if, if we're not seeing favorable lab results, we're not at that time going to be prepared to lift the do not drink, do not boil. But uh, all mainline sampling data we've got right now looks uh, very positive, so. And we're also getting ready to update our website with additional mapping to show, you know, we talk about zones, but customers are questioning, you know, where these zones are. So we're going to be putting out additional mapping that shows each and, uh, of our individual zones. And the uh, staff, Nate, is working with the State Water Resource Control Board on a long-term VOC monitoring plan to continue to monitor. And that's gonna go on for how long, Nate? Uh, at a minimum, it will be going on until December of 2022. Yeah, so there'll be a, a long uh, standing monitoring program uh, after we get back to the do not drink as well. If I can add to both of those two, uh, Riverside Grove, all connections have been disconnected to burnt homes and testing was done on Monday of this week. We are waiting for lab results to come back so that way we can submit to the state to lift that zone. Um, everything pre-hand to the service laterals being disconnected for a couple of weeks, there was no detect. Um, we're pretty positive on the lifting of that next week at some point. Uh, we are working on the Lion Zone, 236 of West Park area. 
We are still just disconnecting services. Hopefully having them done, I was hoping to have them done today, but we ran into a lot of leaks this week. So we're still working and moving ahead. Um, hopefully this Saturday, I have a crew coming in to continue working and hopefully we get them done on Saturday and we'll do our final testing on Monday or Tuesday of next week. And hopefully we can move ahead with them and get them lifted before that date of the 28th. Right, the, uh, the communication that you referred to, Nate, what, what format did that take? Was it just posting it on the website or were there emails, letters? How was it communicated? It was, uh, it was posted on the website as well as a Facebook post, I believe. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Director Moran, you have your hand up. Yes, um, I'm a little confused, but uh, see if you can help me out here, guys and girls. Um, so if uh, the laterals that we're removing, are they on houses that are occupied or just burnt houses or so help me out with that. So the laterals that are removed are from destroyed homes and burnt homes. Okay. We are not removing any laterals to homes that are still existing. Okay. So when we remove, thank you. And so, uh, so when we remove those laterals, are we going to put them back? Yeah, so with that, we're giving each resident a letter and that we do encounter, and they will all get the letter eventually stating that they need to contact the district for to put in their new service lateral and their new meter location. The big thing is to work with them on meter yeah. location because of a lot, a lot of our meter locations in these areas were very difficult to begin with in redwood tree groves or in tree roots or whatever and whatnot. So we're gonna work with the customer to put it where they want it to be and hopefully make it more, advent, you know, better for the district and better for the customer at that point. And they will all be put in with one inch service lines and then they will have to be recalculated obviously for fire towers. Okay, and how Rick, many, let me, how many homes? Rick, let me just quick add to that. Those connections that are the homes that are destroyed, they are not being charged even the basic amount. And as we remove these services, you know, there's no, there's no monthly charge, there's no nothing. Now, if a customer comes in and requests that to be put back, if we set that meter back, then the charges begin. Okay. Because, you know, then we have to start reading that meter and monitoring and so forth. So, and that's kind of how that works. I just want to okay. let you know. And how many homes were actually burnt, destroyed? I Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe the number is right around 120 to 126, something in there. Yeah, it's somewhere around 120. Okay, thank you. I'm not confused anymore. <laughs> thank you. How about that anyways? Uh, Director Fultz. You have a question? Yeah, so picking up on that, uh, Rick, because I was also a little confused about the numbers. So I've, I've heard before that we have about 330 uh, customers that are in the do not um, zone. Uh, that includes the homes that have been burned. Yes. As well. So of those- well, th It doesn't include all the homes that have been burned. Because some of these pocket areas, we replaced the whole mainline system. So, when we went through and replaced the whole mainline system, we did not run services to the homes that were burnt in those systems. And those areas were lifted early because we replaced the whole mainline system. And we ran new service laterals to all those customers in those zones and they have been lifted. So there is some of those burnt homes are not included in the do not drink, do not boil. But the majority. So, so what I'm trying to get to, let me tell you what I'm trying to get to. What I'm trying to get to is the number of SLVWD subscribers that will be offline for some period of time due to the fact their homes either been destroyed or damaged tragically. And the number of people that have been, whose homes are still intact, but have been offline now for an extended period of time due to this do not 
um, notice. So um, I'd like to get to those numbers as soon as we can if we don't have those already. They're, pre they're pretty easy to put together. You know, I, I, you know, James is right. We do have a couple pockets, but the majority of those homes are in uh, the do not drink areas, you know, Riverside Grove and, and Boulder Brook. Um, but we can, we can work on uh, some of those numbers. Uh, and I'm not sure if all of those homes have been repopulated yet either. Um, we just received a list from the County of Santa Cruz of our, of our address customers that are in hotels. Um, so we haven't got a chance to look at that yet either. So, you know, looking ahead at supporting the people whose homes were destroyed or seriously damaged in terms of how we do that, I think, James, that your idea is great. Let's do it good for everybody. Um, and that has a um, financial impact obviously to the district. We don't wanna be charging people if they can't use their home. And then concurrently with that, the people that have been on this do not drink, do not boil notice, effectively um, limiting their use of that water. Um, I, I'd like to understand that because they've been on that now for what, six weeks. Um, and out of their house longer, obviously, up to two months. Mm -hmm. um, and so that also, uh, we need to make sure we're supporting those folks as well who have not had full use of the, the water that they had expected to use. Yeah, so, we have some customers that were repopulated two months ago now at this point and that are still in do not drink, do not boil. And I think we need to do something simple and straightforward to make sure they're not paying full boat for effectively water that, you know, isn't being able to be used full boat. I'd like to see that on a future agenda. With respect to that, are they in all in the same uh, Riverside zone, Riverside Grove zone? No, you have the Lion zone as well. Yeah, there's two zones, basically, at this point. There's only two zones. I mean, most problem. people got put back online pretty quickly. I think it was only a couple of weeks that we were out, 10 days, something like that. These are the folks that have been out for an extended period of time, and I think they need to be addressed separately and in a special way. And that's another thing with the pressure zones, where Mr. Rogers was talking about the pressure zones earlier. It's kind of a little bit difficult right now when somebody looks at the map and sees the pressure zones because we were able to cut partial residents of these pressure zones over to other pressure zones to get them in water and get them off the do not drink, do not boil. But at the same time, we're having pressure issues in some of these areas because they're not on the zone they're supposed to be on at this point. Sure. But we got them to where they are off of the do not drink, do not boil at a lower pressure. And we figured that was the best route to go at that point. Are some of these pressures at 15 to 20 pounds or less? No, we're still supplying 20 plus to all customers. 20 plus. Okay, well, that's actually. <laughs> but if they go from, if they go from 120 down to 40, they notice the difference. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I get it. But yeah. if they're above 20, I'm jealous. So, yeah. There you go. That's that's true. You, you would be. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but I think we need to have a uh, item where we discuss how we're going to address these issues with people. Thank you. Bob, uh, any other questions, comments from uh, directors? If not, we'll go to the uh, public. The, uh, Tina, we recognize you. Feel free. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention to James because he said something about sending out notices to certain people. Um, I just today received a letter that had been sent to my home on 236. My home was damaged, and but the, but the mail is taking, um, this letter is dated September 16th. So it's almost a month between the time that somebody sent me something and I actually received it. So I wanted you to be aware that these people, if you're sending these letters to even their homes or their forwarding addresses, it may take a while for them to get anything. Um, so I don't know if there's another way around that, if, there's, if they have emails or something you could send out. But I just wanted you to be aware that, um, yeah, the mail, and, and there's a lot of stuff I'm just not getting at all. And I went to the post office and they said, 
there's a lot of people whose mail has just basically disappeared over the last two months and we don't know what's happening with that. So I just wanted to make the board aware that this is something and the staff as well, that this is something that's happening. It's really frustrating as far as getting mail goes. And if you're sending out notices, the people may or may not get them at all. Right. Um, the thing with the letter was our crews were out doing the disconnections and they were running into a lot of homeowners that were allowed to be repopulated and they were coming to their burnt homes and they were questioning as to why we were removing the laterals and our maintenance department is not customer service, you know, and they're not out there to answer questions They're out there to do their jobs. And so they came to us with the concern is, you know, what are we supposed to say? So we put the letter together because we were running into so many of these people to where we could just have, they could just hand them this and say, you know, sorry about your loss, and but here's what you need to do. And we're here to work with you. We're not, you know, just removing you. We're not abandoning you. This is what we're doing. It has in, you know, and so it explains to them. And then we mailed out to these residents as well. So a lot of residents got them in hand and I understand the mail is issue right now. So hopefully we can do something else. Mail's been problematic. I'm missing, I'm missing license plates. We haven't got our mail back. So then I had one more thing. Um, it was concerning uh, Director Fultz's comment about how some people have been out of do not drink and do not boil for some time or been on the drink, do not drink and do not boil. My home is actually included in that. So I live along 236 and I'm, I can't use or drink or cook with the water that's at my house. And um, I did see that you got a delivery of water recently, but it is, uh, I only have like one of those, um, it's like three gallon tanks or something that I run down and I fill up. Um, and so it's something that I would be like appreciative. And I understand if the board's financial situation doesn't warrant this, but it would be helpful to like have some sort of compensation for the fact that like I can't drink the water or at my house. Um, so I just wanted to make that comment as someone who is affected by that. And thank you, that's all I have. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from Okay, uh, back to you, Rick. Okay, uh, our, our next uh, item is the CZU fire distribution of bottled water uh, in our filling station located at our operations building uh, in Boulder Creek. Uh, in response to the CZU wildfire damage to district facilities, resulting in the interruption of water service and the do not drink, uh, do not boil order. The district uh, has been distributing bottled water and installed a water bottle filling station at the operations building in downtown Boulder Creek. In the beginning, water was made available to anybody who wanted it with a two case limit per day and unlimited filling of the bottles at our filling station. Uh, the water has been donated ongoing by the County of Santa Cruz through the Office of Emergency Services and many organizations such as uh, the American Red Cross, Santa Cruz Police, Fire Departments, Retail Stores, Bottled Water Providers, um, uh, Budweiser. I mean, there's been so many people and many volunteers from the community have spent time uh, distributing water to the community, you know, including we had Boy Scout uh, troops and and just people in general coming down, uh, staff, spouses, and just wanting to come down and, and help uh, pass out water. Makes it really easy if uh, customers don't have to get out of their cars. It, you know, the, the operations building isn't made for parking and uh, drive up and load, uh, keeps people moving. Uh, in the early stages of the repopulation, the district was distributing water to approximately 4,000 connections. Uh, as time went on, the amount of water being distributed was estimated at eight pallets per day. Distributing water became time consuming. Uh, we, we, were, we had to go down to the county. They didn't have a forklift that worked. We had to go down to the county and load, unload pallets of water. Um, it, it's becoming more difficult to receive donations. Uh, our district secretary and, and our environmental planner are reaching out, spending, uh, start spending some time uh, trying to get the, the bottle of water. Um, to uh, reduce uh, the amount of water needed, the district reevaluated water distribution 
and limited to only people who lived in the areas of the SLV water district, Big Basin Water, Bracken Bray Water, and um, Forest Springs. Um, those, those areas uh, either are out of water or are in a do not drink um, condition. Um, and that was some, roughly some estimated at some 1,200 connections total. Uh, to date, it's estimated that about 260 uh, pallets of bottled water have been distributed at the operations building. You know, the bottle filling station where residents bring empty containers and fill, uh, and fill them themselves is, is, is very popular and gaining popularity. Uh, it greatly reduces the, the amount of, of, of small plastic bottles. To date, approximately 20 units, uh, almost 15,000 gallons of water has been distributed uh, through the filling station. Um, water distribution uh, has been uh, free of charge to the community. The district has minimal cost uh, with staff time and has purchased, uh, we purchased about 100 uh, five gallon containers for district customers that were given strictly to district customers. That was at a cost of $1,000. Um, looking at the district's water uh, quality uh, cleanup efforts, it's projected that the remaining 350 district connections could be back in water restored uh, by uh, that October 29th. Um, once the district's water quality is restored and the do not drink order is lifted, uh, we will start to close down uh, the distribution of water at the operations building. Notifications will be given to the public and other water providers. I've sent emails out to Big Basin Water, Brackenbury Water, and Forest Springs Water uh, to inform them that uh, we have a potential of getting uh, our do not drink order lifted and we will be uh, rolling back uh, the uh, bottled water. Uh, communications uh, with the neighboring water districts have been very limited. I haven't heard back from uh, any of the, the three agencies I sent out emails to. Uh, I thought and uh, the county uh, environmental health has reached out to the district um, wanting to maintain the filling station uh, through the end of the year, which is not a bad idea. Um, the amount of water that that is distributed is not that much. Um, it's not very uh, staff. Uh, there's hardly any staff time, maybe going out and wiping down the station three or four times a day. Um, but uh, that would be good for the, the community because these other agencies, they have no, uh, no end in sight of when their system will be potable again. Um, and it, it is burdensome to, to folks. So uh, I would be recommending leaving uh, our filling station up through uh, through the end of the year. And, and on another note too, it's you know we've had people that come up as far as Aptos trying to get water. There's it's become problematic. People see things for free; uh, they want them. A lot of people are not in the the do not drink areas. It's getting confrontational with staff for staff to maintain a supply because we got close to running out, if not ran out, last week one day. And we ask people where they're coming from. We try to police it a little bit, but it's become uh, confrontational. Uh, there's been uh, uh, sifting boxes made by the Boy Scouts and other organizations that are for people to take to their homes and sift looking for valuables or momentums. We've had people come in. One guy tried to take a half a dozen of them to build a chicken coop. You know, we had to, to run him off, so to speak. So it, it's become problematic. Um, dealing with with folks uh, as time went on, um, so that's kind of where we're at on the uh, on the bottled water. Uh, be happy to take any questions. It's been a very successful uh, distribution. I mean, we get a lot of great comments from people. People, on the most part, are very thankful. It turns out to be quite uh, the gathering place, as Director Morano said. The county was giving out free meals. There was people were giving out free backpacks, children's shoes. It was it turned into quite the the giveaway location, and and there was a lot of uh, good support of the district and on our endeavors there. With that, I'll take questions. That's great, um, Director Fultz. Thanks for that update, Rick. I I think it's really a good thing that we. Uh, did all of that. I'm hopeful that we're keeping track of who's been donating so that we can make sure we send out formal thank yous on behalf of the district, the, the board, and the staff for everything that people have done. Um, 
I, as you recall, one of the things I asked you about was what we could do for big basin water given the destruction that happened to the system. And, and I got a sense of that when I was down working, uh, handing out the water where I'd say about half the people that came up during the time I was there in the morning were from big basin water. Um, and they were greatly appreciative of the fact that, um, you know, we were there and, and supporting them in that way. Is, is the end of the year going to be long enough uh, given the damage that has happened to their system? And is there a more sort of permanent solution that uh, that can be done to, uh, to help out here? I, I, I just, I don't think they're going to have that system back up and running here in, you know, two and a half months. I don't want to get you know too far off the item. Um, I can't answer a lot of those questions except we have reached out. I have had contact from a, a lot of people from Big Basin to talk about what we could do for Big Basin. And well, the other relative to leaving the water, so not the water system up for sure. Longer right. term, we can have that as a separate agenda. Item, but is two and a half months long enough? We need the. The, the folks at these mutuals to reach out to us and to communicate what their needs are and what they would like us to do. And there's a, there's a little bit of a lack of communication, not just with this district, but with the county and with the state, they're not talking. Um, and so I, you know, if they would reach out to us and talk with us, I'm, I'm sure we would work with them. Um, but not hearing anything back and, you know, no communications whatsoever is kind of, you know, I, you can lead a horse to water type of thing. And it, it, they need to communicate with us. Well, I mean, I, I mean their customers are communicating with us. They yeah, they very are, clear. They're, they're in a rock and a hard spot. They don't know what to do. And, and there's other agencies, the county's working on that and the state's working on that, but we could even move, you know, that, that filling station closer to big basin sure. at the end of our system. Once we're back in a potable situation, I mean, there's things that we can do to work with them, but they have to reach out to us. I reached well, out only, a couple times. Yeah, and not only that, me and Rick were in a meeting earlier today for de debris flows, and it was stressed from the county OES head person that they're not contacting anybody out there. I mean, they're not even communicating with, they're not communicating with anybody. Well, I, I, I get, for us I get to that. Take, for us to take on the burden of what goes on down here at the water district, passing out water to these customers that are customers of the district. I understand they're part of our valley and they're part of what we are, but the confrontations and the stuff, it's just out of control. <coughs> it can't well, go on forever. Well, I, I think there's a difference between having lots of things there that you're handing out, including the pallets of water versus a filling station. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I would imagine that the folks that are in charge of those systems probably have so many alligators snapping at them, <laughs> right? That that they don't they don't even know which one to go after first. But at the end of the day, we have people up there. There's they have 500 or so subscribers, and there's probably a thousand people or more that need water. And um, I'm I'm concerned about cutting that off too fast, given particularly given if we were just doing the filling station, not anything else. Um, right. I, I'm concerned about that. We'll, and, we'll, we'll definitely reach out all along you know, the way uh, and, and try to, you know, work with them and, and let's cut them some slack. Right. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. The filling station is one thing, but procuring water and handing out water to residents James, is James, a whole other thing. No, I'm hearing you. I'm not advocating for that. At the end right, of the do not that. drink, do not boil process, Cutting all that off, I completely understand. That is a, I mean, even with volunteers, that's, that's a lot of effort. But the filling station is another thing. And, and candidly, most of the people from Big Basin, <clears throat> at least that I encountered, and again, it's anecdotal sample, but still, they were using the filling station, not the, right. um, right. not the, not right. the, the bottle right. water. So I, I let, let's, you know, let's see if we can cut the people some slack. I mean, they are our neighbors yeah. and we do need to help. We will. Thank you. Okay, Bob, uh, Director Moran. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I'm really glad of the effort that we've made here. 
with uh, distributing distributing the water. Uh, we're trying to meet people's needs. And uh, as we get uh, more people back online, uh, there's less need. So I, I'm totally uh, behind cutting out the bottled water and uh, just switching to refillable uh, containers at the, um, what are you calling it, the filling station. So uh, I would support that. And as Bob said, I think, uh, you know, we can commit ourselves to the end of the year uh, and reassess it then. If the need's still there, um, you know, we're not gonna disregard people's needs. So uh, we've done a great job of doing that and I think we'll continue doing that. Um, but they should know that we're gonna continue it at least till the year and uh, reassess after that. And um, I just really am impressed about how uh, everyone has done really well with this. And I understand, unfortunately, you know, the people that take advantage of it. And uh, I drove up through there today, and the only thing I can say about communicating is maybe that big road sign that says conserve water and flashing lights, you could say, please contact Rick Rogers. At <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Put my phone number out there, too. I have offer, uh, Rick. <laughs> other than that, I have no other suggestions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Rick. Uh, any other comments or questions from any of the board? Okay. The, the, the water that, the, the bottled water that's being handed out, this is total donation, right? I mean, we're not buying that, are we? That's correct. It's all been donated to this. The only thing we expensed is we bought the five gallon containers uh, yeah. for our, uh, our staff to give out um, to our residents, but it's all been donated. I mean, we're trying, we've been trying to get big bottles, you know, five gallon bottles and, and empty containers donated, but that's been a little more difficult, um, but 100% donated. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you, Rick. And the, uh, any of the public have questions or comments about the uh, bottled water and filling station? Nothing? Okay. Getting back to uh, the agenda, although Rick, I'm going to interrupt you right here between uh, new business and the consent agenda, and I wanted to uh, make the following announcement. As a lot of you know, I've sold my property in Ben Lomond, and I've I've moved out of state, and it's the likelihood is that I am not going to be returning to the state. So. Um, because of that, I'm going to uh, lose my qualification to serve as a board member in the future. Uh, so I'll be submitting a resignation in the near future, uh, effective at a point in time yet to be determined specifically. But I wanted to let uh, the board and any of the public that's participating know that at this time. And uh, I've consulted with council and staff on this. And so we'll be having a orderly, uh, transition that we won't interrupt the flow and activity of, of the water district as a result. So just to mention that. Uh, moving on, we have the consent agenda coming up next. We have uh, any, uh, any, anybody want to pull anything from the minutes or, or uh, the disclosure report for the reimbursement? Lou? Yes, thank you, President Swan. I have several questions for two of uh, the departmental reportees, uh, one for environmental and one for finance, or several for environmental and, and two for finance. Carly, if I may, looking at your monthly report under the sustainable water supply planning, bullet item number four, permit intertide pipelines to optimize operations and sustainably manage water supply. Where are we with that? That's a good question. Um, Rick might be able to answer that better at this point, um, but pretty much all our focus has been fo has been shifted to the emergency response. Um, Rick, do you have anything to add? What, I, I, I didn't listen to, I couldn't hear his specific question on, on I heard pipe and that was it. Right. It so was uh, bullet item number four under the sustainable water supply planning section. 
and it referred to the permit inner tie pipeline to optimize operation. And that, think, that's the uh, that's that's the CEQA review. Well, I, I believe it's my mind, it's more the selling water to Scotts Valley. Right. It's the inner tie, the emergency inner tie, Rick. Changing it to a to a regular inner tie. Right, and 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 we're working. That's what we're working with. Uh, the, the county of Santa Cruz with the uh, Sierra and that group through that grant. Um, it has taken a back seat right now. Um, and we are, we have met and to start to put back a schedule to, to pull these, these more regular projects that we put on the back burner due to uh, the fire. Uh, and I do believe the county is getting ready to submit that. Um, and start putting together the RFP for that to go out for the environmental review. The RFP is actually out currently. Okay, so it was released a week ago. That, that's moving along. Uh, I just, I just haven't spent any time on it. Yeah, I, I understand why progress hasn't been made, and I, and I, and I certainly am not trying to um, push you. I'm just trying to see where where we are with that since it was on the monthly report. Second right. item is under conjunct conjunctive use grant. The the last bullet item. The complete conjunctive use plan is 90% finished and should be available for public review by September. Where are we with that? Right, so right now we are waiting for our um, permitting, the consultant to be selected for the environmental permitting on the conjunctive use. Um, okay. Pretty much uh, Mike Podlek, who is working on the conjunctive use plan is waiting for that feedback to then complete the plan. Um, so he could have it done once we have that information for him pretty quickly. We're just kind of waiting for the next piece to fall into place so that he can then complete the plan for us. And sure. as soon as that's complete, we'll bring it to the board. Great, thank you. And last question for you, the CIP project permitting. Staff is working to secure permits for the following projects. I'm particularly interested in the Fall Creek fish ladder, the swim tank replacement, and the five pipeline project. Any updates there? Right, so swim tank, we are bringing the, um, the final ISMND, so the initial study report to the board at the November 5th meeting. Um, so there'll be a, probably a pretty large conversation around that. Um, I imagine the public will be pretty involved. Uh, and as soon as that's approved, then we can start moving that project forward. Um, but we'll continue that next month. And then Fall Creek Fish Ladder, uh, right now we received the agreement from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife um, in August, but we ended up bringing it back to them after Gina reviewed um, and gave us some feedback. And they're currently in the process of approving that amendment to the agreement. And once we have that, we'll sign it. Um, and then next after that, we'll follow the um, NIMPS permitting which is their uh, bio, uh, biop or biological opinion, as they call it. Uh, and that's kind of contingent on the CDFW permit. And then after that follows will be the Army Corps. So once one is confirmed, the rest kind of fall into place. But most likely we'll be going to construction for that project next year in spring. And the five pipeline project? So I'll, I'll chime in on the five pipeline project. So we had the fire and everything, and we had them off the job for 40 days straight. Um, so we are back on the job as of two weeks ago. They're making great headway on the Hillside and Reynolds project out on Fern Drive, north of town. They plan on moving into California Drive on Monday for potholing and figuring out where utilities are. Uh, letters getting ready to go out to that community tomorrow. We were working on that today, punching all that up. So we will be delivering to that community tomorrow. Rick, you can deliver the word. <laughs> and so we'll be moving in there on Monday um, just for potholing. It's not gonna be major construction at that point. Uh, and so that's all moving forward. And we are still in design on Quail Hollow and Sequoia and Lion. Uh, partial of Lion now, since the CZU fire, part of that was damaged. So we are working on the logistics of how that's all gonna work out on if we're gonna, if we can split part of that off and do it on part of the whole emergency response. And then uh, Quail Hollow, where they're getting pretty close. They had us, they contacted us to go back out and locate the two connection points. 
Uh, they have everything else done. They're just working on the connection points at this point. And Sequoia, I think, is pretty much ready to go. They're getting ready to send it to us for review. So everything on that end is moving ahead, and we do plan to have those plans for the three that are not being constructed this year ready to approve by the end of this winter, and then hopefully go to construction bid and construction early spring, uh, early summer. So, and Carly, the environmental review for the Quail Hollow project, you want to update the board on that? Right. So we received the draft of the ISMND, the initial study, and um, we should have that finalized by our staff internally. And then once we have that, we'll go to the public review. So probably next month, we'll be opening up the ISMND to the public for the review. Great, excellent. Thank you, James. Thank you, Carly. Mm -hmm. uh, one question, one comment for uh, Stephanie on finance. The question is, um, what is the status of our reserves currently? And then the, the comment is, would it be uh, advantageous to have a status report to the board, every board meeting on the cash flow situation for the district? So we've spent roughly through September about, it's around 800, between 800 and a million dollars. So the reserves have essentially gone down to closer to 2 million. Um, I still need project estimated costs and timelines for us to be able to go out and get different, you know, to, to know what we need exactly for lending. Um, but the majority of the spending, you know, it came in the beginning. So it should start to balance out. Once we get the FEMA allocation, then we'll be able to go out and get the bridge loan, um, which is much, which is very easy for that because it's a FEMA backed item. Um, we can continue to have, you know, on the monthly reports, something ab about the exact cash flow. Are you concerned about cash flow? Yes, I am. We need to start getting some of the forecasts for how quickly we're going to be burning through the money figured out. And then on top of that, you know, it's, we're talking about potentially three plus million dollars that we're going to foot no matter what. Um, you know, so it, we do need to bring it to budget and finance to figure out kind of what the district's long-term plans are for recovery. I agree, Lou. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. There'll be several items that we'll bring to budget and finance committee to discuss. So we need to discuss, uh, you know, we're starting back up our late fees to customers and we do have, we are starting to have several customers' bills that are, you know, six months eight months to a year uh, uh, behind and we need to at least review that and, and let the finance committee, um, maybe we should make some recommendations on trying to increase uh, our collections. Okay. Do we have any other uh, questions or comments from any of the directors? If not, do the uh, public have any comments or questions they'd like to ask on this topic? Uh, okay, moving along, district reports. Uh, are there any status reports that anybody wants to share outside of what we've already seen from environmental, operations, finance, or legal? I'll take that as a no. Committee reports, any committee reports to uh, report on? I'll take that as a no as well. Director's reports. No, okay. Um, in the packet, we have some written communications that you can all read. Uh, and just, uh, I, if I may, uh, Chair yeah. Swan, uh, the petitions and the letters received, that will be addressed at the next board meeting. Uh, in uh, the response, the environmental response, we will have um, those grouped and answered um, through that process. Terrific. Thank you very much, Rick, and everybody for participating and uh, showing up for the meeting tonight. And with that, we will call ourselves adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.